Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to this webinar in the framework of Turning the Tide, which is a, a large scale cooperation project funded through Creative Europe. And it involves partners in Sweden, Sweden is the lead partner, in Poland, Greece, Austria, Netherlands, and we are in Scotland, Fable Vision is Scotland, sadly unable to continue to be a partner due to Brexit, but we're honoured and delighted to be able to remain uh, part of this European community. Um, the Turning the Tide project is looking at climate change and asking the question, can cultural planning approaches, can socially engaged artists uh, embedded in cultural planning approaches make a difference um, in the exploration of finding new solutions uh, in terms of climate change? And our first uh, webinar of this series uh, was was looking at socially engaged practice. We had a guest speaker, Dr. Tara Bell. And um, if anybody missed that, I'll put the link into the chat so that you can um, catch up on that too. Um, the, the, today's webinar is looking at cultural planning as a, as a practice, cultural mapping and cultural planning. And uh, we're very honored and delighted to have uh, Leah Gallardi with us today. Leah is a, an expert with vast experience. She's also a long time colleague of mine who's done a huge amount of work in Scotland, uh, creating and helping to promulgate the, the dialogue about cultural planning approaches in Scotland. Also, I know she's done a huge amount of work in Sweden and in all sorts of other parts of Europe, inclu including Eastern Europe. So um, I'm going to hand over the floor now uh, to Leah. Leah is going to make a presentation uh, of about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will have time for questions. So as you're listening, please think of the questions you'd like to ask. Put them in the chat. Um, the chat box is, is on the bottom of your screen there, or you can raise your hands. And if you want to raise your hands and ask a question, uh, there's, a, there's a, a button called reactions at the bottom of your screen. And there's a, a, an ability to raise your electronic hands in there. So without further ado, Leah, you. over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, let's go. So if I, if I start by sharing, um, yeah. should be okay. Off we go. And, um, so first of all, um, just two words about myself before we, we plunge into, um, what you see here and some reflections. I just wanted to tell you a brief, a brief story. I hope, Liz, if I go over the 10, 12 minutes, please alert and uh, uh, we will stop and then pick up again in the question answer. Uh, no doubt we'll have time for that. Just a quick story. Uh, since I was small, I always had this obsession with cities. I grew up in a very small town in Italy and I always been sitting there until the age of 14, 15, thinking there are big cities out there which I need to see, there are lives out there which I need to live. Uh, there is a parallel universe that has to be different than a kind of provincial town in Italy where everything is boring, etc. So this madness, this passion, literally a passion for, uh, for cities and places and, and contributing to uh, making places different, etc., has stayed with me since I was a child, basically. And it's still with me, I'm glad to say. Uh, so, so many, many, many years after doing, uh, I come from um, urban sociology, uh, then I did some work uh, with uh, arts management, and then some work with planning, 
uh, studying clusters, uh, creative clusters, and so on and so forth. But what I retain, after all, is this passion and this idea that cities are really not just urban in the sense of physical, the urbs, as the Romans used to call it, but they are also the civitas, the people, and they are the polis, the organizations, the institutions, the, 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 the political structure that governs the city. All this is place, it's cities. So guys, let's move on. When, well, from what I learned when I was studying sociology, it was just one way. Then when I moved into studying urbanism, it was just the other way. And just saying urban designers can change the life of communities. And then I was always saying, mm, how can they just by themselves? And this constant idea that we need to think holistically about place. And we need to think in a way that we can see each place is different than the other because of, of this connection between the physical, the spiritual, the history, et cetera. But let me just step back here and look at these reflections I have here. The, the pandemic, it seems to me, I, has in a, in a sense highlighted the kind of rupture between this, the, the, of this bond between the urbs and the civitas and the polis. Um, and there are different reasons for it. Uh, Bernardo Secchi, the urbanist, the Italian urbanist, um, 12 years ago, I think, he wrote a book and he said, um, well, we are facing a, a just another big global urban crisis. And uh, he was saying the last one we saw, it's at the time of rapid urbanization in the 19th century. So we are now facing an equally massive urban crisis. And, and you know what? He was saying the urban crisis is due to what? To the division between rich and poor, to the segregation uh, within cities, to the kind of class division in cities. So he recognized that and he actually said also that is the job of urbanists to work with communities to address these issues. And if we don't do that, the consequences will be catastrophic as we are beginning to see now. Uh, I, once again, he was writing about this 10, 12 years ago. Um, more recently, um, uh, I found the, the, the work of Michael Sandel uh, very interesting. And the, he came to say that the pandemic has shown a light, and I'm reading from my notes here, on, on the fact that we were not only logistically or technically unprepared for it, but we were morally unprepared for it. And, and he says the pandemic uh, demanded a kind of solidarity that a few society can summon up. Why? Why is it, why is it so? Because we have become habituated to a world divided into winners and losers, uh, where growth is still, despite of the catastrophic a situation with the environment we are in, despite of that, we are still considering growth only in economic terms um, and strictly related to consumption. So the more I produce and the more I consume, the better my society will grow. This is the idea. So essentially, the, the common good, if you will, is morally is assessed morally in economic terms. So it's, uh, it's the market that decides on how human beings should flourish, etc. cetera. And, and that has consequences, I imagine, for what we are imagining our society of the future. So that is not a good starting point. So the question in a minute is, what do we do about it? Um, also, on top of what Sandel ob observed um, is that the rise of populism was perfectly predictable given that uh, we were kind of dividing the world in winners and losers and the winners are the fortunate ones, the ones that are entitled, the one that maybe had more of a possibility to get a good start in life, etc. So if the world is divided like this and more inequality we, we, we have and, and it's more and more it's difficult to uh, reimagine 
a better society where we put the human beings at the center and the flourishing of human beings at the center. Um, in, uh, in terms of cultural planning, in, in the past, we have seen a model of cultural planning emerging in the year 2000, 23 years ago, uh, uh, through what I call the Floridization of cities. Um, and here, you, we all know, we saw policies that were maybe right for the time, maybe, I'm saying, preface with that, maybe, maybe right for certain cities, but not good for every city. And uh, um, what civic leaders did, uh, you know, again, based on the idea that there was a class of technocrats that were creative, and these were the people that had produce value for the society, not the working classes, not the people who service these creatives, not the people who made things again, but it was this class of technocrats. So the class of technocrats wanted, needed culture, cultural infrastructure, amenities, etc. So the idea was the more we produce an environment in a city, in a place, large or small, that can guarantee that we will attract these creatives, the more our economy and society will grow. Uh, but the concept of justice was not there. And in fact, the byproduct of some of, of these turbocharged cultural planning policies were, were really, or cultural policy, somebody would, would call them, uh, the result and the byproduct of these turbocharged policies were divided cities, people who could not afford to live there, uh, rents, uh, exponential cost of living, and so on. So uh, the result was uh, lots of creatives to abandon cities. So time to take a different approach. And I think I'm moving towards thinking, well, maybe there is a time now for cultural planning 3.0. Uh, maybe this has time and it's now because it's exactly starting from this point of view of what kind of a society do we want to live in? I think that's the moral principle that we have to put at the core of this cultural planning 3.0 as I see it. And, and to me, the values that we, put, we have to put in the first instance are the idea that we have to grow and replenishing resources and energy. So it's not anymore about extracting value as we used to say. And it's a lot more about the well-being of the community. It's more about freedom and social justice. So in my view, if we talk about cultural planning 3.0, it's also refocusing policies on ensuring that we enable the capability of people to achieve the best for their lives the best that they want in life, the best life that they want to live. So this, and I would put at the center of this um, pl cultural planning 3.0 is this idea that Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum uh, uh, talked about um, a few years ago. I think I, I would like to see this revived and expanded uh, into the environment of cultural planning. So we give, it's basically saying, if we engage artists, if we work with culture at community level, we are more likely to enable this capability of people to reach their goals in life, to live a better life. Um, I think that's, that's, my, that's my view at the moment, but it's, it might be debatable. Um, so how do we go about getting to this 3.0 uh, cultural planning? To me, it's really the first and foremost is understanding your community, which means also understanding uh, your, your, your place. So if, 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 there is, you know, if there is no no planet B, then we still have to live in a society that uh, we still have to lay the ground for a different, different cities, different places, and a different society. So I'm saying, let's come back to the micro. Let's come back to the granular. Let's come back to the communities we are working with. And let's, once again, delve deeper into the dynamics of these communities. Let's map out 
what is going on in those communities, but not just in terms of what are the needs of these communities, but also from a point of view of what are the, the potential offered by this, the, the potentials offered, offered by these communities. What is going on that is positive? Are there projects, ideas, policies already in that, in the texture of that community that we could bring out, develop further in a perspective of sustainability and, and, uh, and, and change? So what Cultural Planning 3.0 will do is will be guided by a, a, a consistent exercise of mapping places, I call it um, DNA mapping of place, but you could call it whatever you want. But it is essentially to me that we conduct, we zoom into this community um, and understand and engage, engage with these communities, whether with art, in artistic way, whether with cultural programs, um, it's, it's, it's up to the communities to decide how and how they want to go. But it's really important that we understand the history, that we enable the communities really to, res to restore their faith in their place, their faith in their capability to change. And that can only be done through, I believe, in engaging in artistic activity, in arts activities, and, and in cultural experiences. So then we see place in this way, I have already mentioned to me, this is your community at the center and is made of this system of relations. It's an ecosystem that we need to study and we need to go deeper into. Now, when we come to the role of artists, and I'm saying it, it may not just be artists, in any case, that intervene in a cultural plan or in a mapping. It, it, might, it, you know, it might be other practitioners also from other fields, it might be psychologists, it might be uh, uh, planners by themselves, although I find that difficult to imagine, but in my experience, maybe of 30 years of doing cultural planning, it happened maybe three times. Uh, but but certainly I have seen many more experiences of cultural map successful understanding of the dynamics of a community and the successful um, devising of strategies of development, holistic development coming out of these mappings than, than when, when artists were involved than, than ever before. Why is this so? Because I think artists have this capacity or arts projects have this capacity to open up a dialogue, a conversation. And also they can help us to see what is going on for what it is as a, as a positive thing, not just as saying, well, that project is rubbish and it's not leading anywhere. So let's start a new project all the time. In an environment in which we need to um, to, to revive our resources rather than, than, than using more resources. We need to save our resources. So we need to rethink what is going on on the ground. For example, if we have buildings, spaces in a neighborhood, in a city, etc., that have been abandoned for a long time, art projects, artists, cultural projects can help us to make sense of the history of those buildings can help the community have an open dialogue about what their aspirations are about those spaces, how they would want to change that, etc. This is a, a small example compared to what can be done with art projects. Uh, but it it's also shows how arts projects and artists have this ability more than I have possibly. If I go into a community as I'm a cultural planning, we need, you know, we are faced with a problem. We need to think a little bit more creative about how we develop this place. So uh, by unlocking empathy within the community, we can put people together from different backgrounds. I was talking about the problem of this disaffection of people who are not included in the economy of, of society right now projects that uh, involve um, writing, 
uh, reading, um, uh, music playing, etc., can engender empathy, can make you feel, okay, I understand the point of view better, the point of view of the other person. The other person may be an immigrant, the other person may be the chief of planning, uh, the other person may be the developer. But somehow, somehow, this level of empathy, I think it's very important that we put it at the center of our work as cultural planning, generating empathy, whether it's through culture or the arts is, is very important because we need to repair our relationship to another. We need to repair our relationship with place as well, with our history and, uh, and cultural project can help us. And also more, more on the more basic level, artists or arts projects, cultural projects can bring new stakeholders to the table of the discussion about strategies, about regeneration, about the future, as I just mentioned earlier. But also um, cultural planning in viewed in this sense in a holistic way, uh, where artists are involved regularly, regularly, and we come to that probably in the discussion, regularly on a regular basis as a tool for unlocking uh, memories, unlocking conflicts, unlocking uh, difficulties within the community. So if involvement of in art or cultural projects is regular, take mainstream, take take it as a as a tool for human development in a city etc we can it, it, this this process can also help local cultural institutions which are still now looking at the back at the past which are still locked in a logic of economic development in a logic of bringing in more tourists never mind then if we have over tourism and that's bad for the environment um, so cultural institutions also and organizations need to understand that now we have a problem with climate and we cannot do big events anymore in big museums because even a festival costs a hell of a lot of carbon emissions. So we again, involvement of artists and, and creatives and, and, and um, cultural practitioners can also help us in a city, in a neighborhood, to understand better what future role cultural institutions and organization uh, can play, especially in view of uh, climate change and the issues we are facing. Um, challenges, there are many, and if you prefer, we can, we can leave this for, for the debate. But the one important one that I regularly meet in my work is the fact that uh, cultural projects, arts projects, engagement of, of artists, etc., is time limited and it's never well funded. This means that cities, civic leaders, uh, heads of departments have not yet understood what I've just said, the arguments that I just that I just put. So we have a bit of a work to do still to raise awareness. First, of the importance of the arts for the, in the development of human beings. And there is a lot of evidence these days of the impact art engagement has, even a neurological level, etc. So that, that argument is there. What the argument is not there is for funding, for supporting, for really believing that in your communities, that your communities can grow, not just economically, but without engagement with each other, without engagement with place, etc., they cannot grow as human beings. And therefore, they cannot grow the resilience enough to face the economic changes that will come with climate change as well. So also, sometimes I find that art projects and have difficulties in getting the attention of the top of the people at the top, and that's a problem. So I, for me, but we, we can discuss this um, you know, more in depth, but for me, I advised my method, and I'm not saying it, it's always okay, but it, it works in some cases, and it's 
I always try to, at the beginning, if we say, okay, we have a problem, we got an issue, we want to get into this neighborhood and we want to see what is going on. We want to set up a strategy for sustainable, sustainable human development, improving the skills and uh, the educational attainment of a community or just improving their capacity uh, to make things or do things anew. Um, the first thing I normally try and do is to get uh, whoever is on the ground working on this project to set up a stakeholders group and just to say, okay, in that stakeholders group, we always need either the planning people, the housing people, the developers, or someone who is at the top, if not the mayor. And then, you know, the decision of what to map, how to map, which kind of, which kind of art projects uh, to do, etc. Artists are obviously there from the beginning, from the beginning, not at the last minute, from the beginning when we set up the stakeholders group. So we have our artists there, we have their vision there on the table of how they would like to involve the community. And then we have um, also an engagement with all the departments involved in the city. Once we have this stakeholders group, this stakeholders group is like, is like, is like our power group in a way. And with that, we can go into other departments and say, look, we want to look at housing. We want to look at co-housing. We want to look at housing for young people, for the elderly, or we want to look at parks and see how we can develop these parks uh, in a way that is more productive, uh, engendering more health and well-being in the community. So it's there you decide what you're gonna map, who you're gonna talk to, etc. Then you brainstorm from the mapping, you brainstorm what comes out, uh, and then you just kind of one by one, you uh, you you action plan what what you have discovered. So you you devise an action plan, and uh, you review progress, etc. I think I have taken my ten minutes or fifteen here. Yes, you have, Leah, and I think it was so fascinating. I, I didn't want to interrupt. I wanted you to develop your arguments. Um, do you want to complete, or do you want to? Um... Oh, I think uh, I think here it's 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 a set of provocation in a way for mm -hmm. some, and uh, I think we can perhaps we stop sharing. Um, we can unpack some of these issues if if through questions or. It's just a discussion. If you want me to pick up on any particular point, I can. Or Thank you. Well, I, I mean, absolutely fascinating. I think um, what it's certainly in terms of the partners in turning the tide, I think um, what you'll be reassuring us all is that we're on the right lines, what you're talking about, DNA mapping. Um, we, in this project, are calling it cartopological mapping. We've got uh, Deer Hunter from Netherlands who are um, doing exactly that for us in, in turning the tide. What you're talking about, raising the awareness, that's exactly what we're hoping to do through this project um, and, and impact on policies and, and impact on planners so that we do enroll and engage. And yes, you know, we can do it bit by bit, bit, bit by bit together. Mm. So we've got some questions in the chat. Um, we've got all artists, this is from Antonia Ire, all artists working on social issues agree about this approach, but that's only theoretical. The structure of power is that mapping, that managing the cities is not interest, those in power managing the cities are not interested in giving away any power. So how do we combat that? Mm. Well, first of all, in when I was talking about artists engaging in this process of getting to know the community and the communi helping the community to get to know themselves, itself or themselves, um, that's not necessarily artists working in the social setting. That could be any artist, artists working in any field of, of creativity, et cetera. It could be cultural projects, et cetera. But what is important, I think, is that we go into this engagement with communities with the idea that we are not helping victims here. 
we are not going to change society with our project. We are just going to understand the dynamics in that community. We are going to act at micro level, a micro level, to set an example, to give confidence to these communities that they can do it, they can grow to give confidence to that communities that they've been heard by someone, um, to, to give confidence to that community, they have the capability of changing their lives. And I think in the first instance, I wouldn't worry who has power or not and those in power don't listen, etc. I think first it's important to start, get started from somewhere rather than in action and saying, God, the world is going to die. We have no planet B. We will all be dead. Well, there is not going to be artists in, in if we have no planet anyway. So, guys, we need to, you know, it's take it pragmatically at the same time and, and, and thinking that each community has its own, as I said, DNA. But by that, I mean its own potential for regenerating. And in doing these mappings, in doing this work, we discover stakeholders that may have power at local level, that may be sympathetic, that may be interested in getting involved or not. It, it's, it's, it's a process mapping. It's not a one-off, as, as I, I was trying to say originally. And that kind of answers. Um... Iona had a question in the chat about how do we get to the table because at the moment nobody disagrees it's a wonderful presentation and everybody's in agreement but how do we get to the table and you've kind of answered that um Remy from Deer Hunter um is is asking uh in applying your plead what is absolutely necessary in my opinion is a methodology or framework for taking decisions. You can't fulfill all interests. Some will precede others. What practical tools would you suggest or can you refer to in order to shape the decision-making process in a transparent way? Yes. Yes, I know. We, we the, the, the problem, there are many problems here and that we are still operating in a, in a sort of what we call democratic system, which is plainly not working anymore. This kind of democracy is not working anymore. So we need to, in a way, to devise our own uh, potent experiment with our own tools. Um, participatory budgeting is one thing. So you could start from there. You could say, OK, the, the, we have that in some countries. I think in Poland, they were particularly developed in cities large and small, et cetera. It would be interesting to see if that is still working and how it works and whether it could work with community projects, uh, et cetera. Now, that participatory budgeting is based on, you know, groups of interest. I, I don't have a problem with groups of interest. If a group of interest in a community said, we have a need for regenerating that park, and the others say, we have um, a need for, uh, for a primary school or something, then we say, Okay, guys, both needs are there, but it's not just about needs, is it? It's it's also about what kind of vision have you community that you come to me saying you want that park and you want that? What kind of vision have you got of your life in the future in this place? And 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 how do you think you're gonna fight for it? How what are the tools you would employ? If participatory budgeting is there, bam, we use that. If Occupation of housing is, is, is possible. Old buildings crumbling uh, in London. Now squatting is, is exponential. So it's exploding again. There are various reasons for that. Uh, but that also helps us to highlight the issues of empty housing in, in neighborhoods and places. So there might be a need more. So it, it is difficult to satisfy everybody. And we always say that. But I don't want us to stop because we are not representing everybody in the community. Quite frankly, I don't mind if I'm not representing anybody. All I'm, I'm saying is we have to start from somewhere. And 
starting from one project, we will learn how to involve the others. We will learn what the uh, origin of the conflict between, let's say, these two, these two levels of the community is. Um, so we learn by doing, basically, with cultural planning. Thanks, Leah. And, you know, the yes, it's, again, in theory, wonderful. But, um, for example, in Scotland, participatory budgeting has been uh, adopted, apparently, by local authorities. But when you actually scratch beneath the surface, it's minuscule amounts of money that are being, I mean, hundreds of pounds rather than uh, millions of pounds that, 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 that are needed for communities to, to take charge. So, um, yeah. yeah, but but if you have if you take the little bit of money that is there, and let's say your problem is they close down the library, which is now the case everywhere, um, for yeah. example, and uh, you need a library, then it's your opportunity with the little money to study a different model of library to to think about okay, there is a building there or there was a library, it's now closed. How can we run it? us, the community, in a different way. What are the potential sources of funding we could use? Um, in the UK, there are different potential sources of funding you can find to uh, com complement this. It all depends on what is going on on the ground in the community and on the nature of the project you are, you're dealing with or the problem you're dealing with. So, so governance structures, so 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 ways of of having that structure to deliver, like community development trusts, for example, that we we talked yeah. a lot about that in yeah. our last mem uh, webinar. Uh, we had we heard about the stove in Dumfries here in Scotland, for example. We yeah. heard about the the show people who are um, forming a a trust to impact the government. Uh, yeah. on their problems and yeah so so thematic development trusts geographically located development trusts um but there may be better examples in other places so let's hear from from everybody remember folks you can put your hand up to 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 speak um by hitting the reactions button and in there you'll find a wee icon saying raise hand in the meantime we'll get some more questions in the chat um, I heard voices from people representing culture asking what is left in a local community after an awareness building project. It's not really the same as placing a sculpture on the square and letting it stay for several, several years. Mm -hmm. Is awareness tangible? Awareness of, of what? I don't understand the question. Sorry. Maybe maybe the person can ask it. Yes, that, that was me. I uh, Ivana here. Hello. Ah, ah hello. Uh, no, but, uh, but we are speaking about coming to to local communities. You mentioned it and creating awareness uh, about uh, about I don't know uh, um, urban planning and 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 connect well, not... planning to it and so on. So okay. so yeah, and we are really working with 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 this uh, in in all our. our collaborations but uh, there are voices saying that why not create a i don't know a, a piece of art instead and put it uh, in the square uh, is that more interesting than creating awareness or working with cult artists to create awareness it's not just to create awareness to be honest with you it really is the aim it's always to to get art involvement in art in general in general, I could be doing a project on reading, for example, that has nothing to do with statues or anything. And then out of that project on reading, get more people in my community to read other books, to read newspaper, to, 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 to be empowered, uh, to go out there and look for a job. So that's what I'm talking about and raising awareness, okay? So mm -hmm. that's one thing. The other thing you're saying, well, there are people who want to put up statues. Good luck to them. All I can see is lately the statues end up in rivers um, and it's very controversial uh, to put up monuments and, uh, and, and big venues again. Big venues, not right now, as I said, uh, there are projects, European projects really, that are studying the impact uh, in terms of carbon footprint of events, of venues, of museums, 
of everything. So the perspective is smaller, smaller and local, smaller and local. This is the perspective I can see from this project I'm studying coming out in terms of sustainability of communities and sustainability of the environment. So we are looking more and more rather than to the big event, to the big statue, to the big whatever, um, city of culture or something, we are looking at reinvigorating the local infrastructure. I know this goes counter to what every government in doing, is doing in the UK, for example, which are cutting the budget for culture, uh, but they, they are equally cutting the budget also for health and social care, etc. So it's not just culture. Um, but in an environment where we say the carbon footprint of big events, et cetera, and big buildings, big museums is gigantic, gyrosmus. So we cannot carry on like this. So the question in one or two years is not gonna be even, even posed anymore. Should I do this big event? No, because you can't, because you pollute like hell. Culture pollutes, culture pollutes at this level. Guys, we need to get this in our brains that we need to work on the small. We need to think with the artist producing things that can go around in the region, in the locality, but we need the venues to host that. That's why I was saying the more we can recycle of abandoned buildings, stuff that uh, you know we left from 20 years ago from the floridization of the city, the more we can reuse those buildings, the better. Thanks, Leo. And uh, again, it's encouraging to hear, I think we're on the right lines with our socially engaged approach, with our artists who will be working on that kind of micro level. Um, one of the things that you talked about was the traditional way of mapping is to look at needs and uh, problems. And what you're talking about in cultural mapping is looking for resources, can you say a bit more about that? Because I'm yes, it, it's it's always been a bugbear of mine, uh, as you know probably uh, for for many years. You know, for many years you you go into a place, and they say, okay, we start a cultural mapping because this place needs um, spaces for meeting places. That would be a classic or something, and then you you go in there and you think, who wants to meet whom? Nobody goes out in the evening. Uh, nobody's meeting immigrants. Uh, actually, there is a sense of isolation, fear in the city. The only places where people meet is the um, department stores or supermarkets or the local market, or maybe the cinema or the sports fields. So then you say, what's your problem? You've got sports fields where kids from different generations, different cultures uh, 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 come and meet. Is that not enough? No. Then do you need to expand this sports infrastructure? So we kind of make sure that, at least from the point of view of health and well-being, we have spaces for that. We we nurture our communities from that point of view. Um, but I I find it particularly irritating these days when when people say, "Oh, we we, we have a need. We have a need for something that they think is needed." but it's never really from the point of view of having studied the community, having worked with the community and the community saying, okay, we got three or four cafes or spaces there, we got a cinema, we got uh, young people maybe need some spaces. Have you told to young people? Oh no, well, but the department of you tell us that. Rubbish, I mean, this is, this is sorry, this is just, not enough to justify investment these days. We need to be much more targeted, much more clued on to really what the dynamics of the community are. I'm working now with uh, a project in Luxembourg on creating a Maison de la Diversité, which is a um, intercultural center, for example. And uh, I went into this project thinking, okay, intercultural center, it means a place where activities, where 120 languages in that 30,000 inhabitants place, where people can meet, 
and go and showcase uh, their food, their cuisine, their music, their uh, literature, etc. Oh, no, 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 no. That intercultural space is assumed that because there are 120 people in there and we do a building where you can offer sensibilization, raising awareness about diversity. And I'm saying, what the hell? So you want to raise awareness until you die? Or many, how many salaries do you need for this? Instead of opening up the space, which is closed now, open up the space, get the community, study, work with them, see who wants to be in there, what their intentions are, what their aspirations are, uh, how they feel about living in the city, and why would they want that space? Do that work, and then the, the building will be alive. And many of our towns and cities uh, have empty buildings now, especially in high streets and retail is, yeah. is dead. And um, yeah, everybody's searching for new solutions to those problems. Yes. So in terms of climate change, Leah, how, how do you see us in turning the tide? Uh, how do you see us taking this forward and making a real impact with this project? We've got all these artists involved in the different cities. We've got the potent, we've got uh, academics involved from uh, various universities and also uh, Creative uh, Carbon Scotland who've been doing this kind of work with artists impacting culture, uh, climate change for many years now. Um, so we, we have a lot of resources at our disposal. Um, how do you see us? Um, so you have a lot of knowledge also at your disposal. And I think that's important. That's important to have all this knowledge uh, uh, together and, and connecting these different disciplines. I think that's important because it's not often done, is it? So we often have projects which are about environmental sustainability, etc., which we have architects doing their uh, their usual nice uh, 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 building or uh, you know sustainable green roofs whatever it is that the latest things is required and then nobody can afford to live there okay so now you have the ability with this project to pull together these different domains different disciplines together with somebody who can reason with the community who can engage uh, creatively with the communities on the ground to work out with them their dreams about their place. So if I have a house that is on a river bank and I've been flooded, I don't know how many times in the last few months in Scotland or in other parts of the world, where else can I go and live? That will be the question. Or do I need to move town and city to work? So. The task is now really to think, to act at small level, but to think big, to think, okay, guys, at small level here, what is that we still have in terms of skills, ability to make things that could be useful if we just recreated this industry using technology, etc., in a way that we can then circulate among the community the product. We can, we can create a, a market that is more internal to the region, the community, et cetera. It's, it's this kind of thinking which is creative in nature and, 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 and which needs to lead us to innovative ways. What I'm saying is we can't come up with the big idea because there are no more big ideas out there apart from the one that this economic system is not working and we need to find an um, economic system that is not based on uh, on money only, but is based on human beings, etc. But other than that, in practical, we need to take small steps rooted in the community still and, and see what happens. It's basically the principle of the perennial experimentation. We have no choice. We have to keep experimenting and we keep incrementing that experiment and disseminating, disseminating the, the information. There is a lot in housing that is happening uh, about self-build, 
about building with sustainable materials, which is very interesting. I don't know why that hasn't yet penetrated into the general discourse about how we're going to live in the future away from floodplains, et cetera, for example. Thanks, Leah. Um, we've got Ulf Anderson, who's been uh, putting some examples of, of works in, in, in the chat. Um, I'm sure everybody will be able to have a look at those, some from Stockholm, uh, some from Australia. Uh, we've got another question for you, uh, Leah. Uh, don't you think that people are scared enough of climate change and threats, uh, the climate change threats, and will refuse to collaborate? It, personally, if, if you ask me personally, I don't think people are scared enough about uh, of, of what is going on. And the, in the mindset of people, it's like they are in denial. It's not happening now, but it, it will happen in 20 years, in 50 years, and et cetera. So I, don't, I think people are not scared enough uh, for, for really generating this sense of crisis. But I think what scares people is the economic disadvantages, is the kind of economic divisions in society, is the poverty. It's the crime, it's the populism. I think that's what scares people. And those are the byproducts of a, of a society of abundance, of exploitation of resources. So I, we, we, we need maybe to reason with them as I did at the beginning of this conversation and saying, look guys, we've done this until now and look where we are. Maybe if we take it from there, we will bring them along in this, in this discussion about how do we want to live in the future? Are we all gonna die? Or do we want to live a better society for, for our kids and their kids, etc.? That's very interesting. We've been, we've been uh, very fortunate to have Creative Carbon Scotland um, who are quite well known in Europe for their work and uh, partners in this project. And they've been allowing us access to their uh, resources, their training resources and, and, and webinars. And uh, all on mitigation, all on climate offsetting, all on, but it all, always, always, we're coming back to that point that it's the poorest in every society globally that is most affected by uh, the impacts. It's climate justice is 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 the big question, and you're going even further. You're saying it's actually the whole makeup of, of it's the a problem. social justice that we need to deal. With. It's not climate justice; it's social justice first, and we need to address that issue of inequality in the first instance. I mean, to be honest, my neighbours here in Brixton, uh, none of them recycle. Even recycle, we got bins for that. They don't recycle. Every Monday morning, they come and ask me. Is this okay to be put in? And, and in the UK, we recycle, I mean, in London, very little. As you know, I mean, even compared to Italy. When I go to Italy, you have five bins on my head, goes crazy thinking which one is which one, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, but even here, as I said, but my neighbors here, which is part of London that is disadvantaged, if not, not deprived, but disadvantaged, the disadvantaged part of my neighborhood, they, they are at a loss, even on these basic things, mm -hmm. just to give you a sense of where we are on this. We've got another question, or it's a comment in the chat from, from, from Tina Harley. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, Leah. And you are, of course, all most welcome to Engelhan Sham Fabriken. Eng, no. Sorry, can't pronounce that. So can you say that for us, Tina? Oh, no, I think Tina, Tina can say a word, maybe. Yeah, I just wanted to say I was so happy to hear you talking about this social justice, Leah, which I do agree with. And I also think that you emphasized like self-building and building in reused material. And that's what we do, and you know that. But I just wanted to invite you all, and especially, of course, you, Leah. Please come and visit us, because I really think that right now, the interest is really big. The municipalities really want to, to cooperate. So I think it's time to share power and to really work together with the civil society. So I just wanted to invite you all okay, put to, it in the to chat. visit us. Put, you put it in the chat, a link. I have put it in the chat. So everyone could 
see the website and you thank have an you, open thank invitation you, thank all you, of Tina. you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Tina. And talking about sharing power, it's time to hear from some of the very powerful folks in the room here. We've got some amazing folks here, some old faces, some new faces. It's wonderful to see you all. Um, let's have some real conversation from, from everybody. Don't um, don't wait to put up your uh, electronic, electronic hands. Just jump in. Everybody's too shy, Leah. Okay, but maybe... Uh, don't know if you think we have exhausted the topic of uh, conversation. Uh, we can <laughs> we can carry on in another uh, another time and do something. We've only else. scratched the surface anyway. Just to finish, then what um, you're talking about artists and um, Ivona was talking earlier on about the expectation of a sculpture in the square or something. What what do you see um, in terms of turning the tide? Uh, artists are at the core of what we're doing. Uh, we're 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 wanting to to work with socially engaged artists in each of the cities. Um, what do you see as? Do you think artists, socially engaged artists, have a role to play in all of this? Yes, of course they they have a role to play in a way that if and they as I said previously, if they go into a community with the mindset that that community has needs, but also has aspirations and has capabilities in there, has has some kind of skills, ideas, um, and, and build on that, and build on that, help them to build on that, help them to overcome barriers. Maybe uh, some people who are skilled in, in a certain trade in the past, uh, uh, they now have lost it, but it could be useful uh, in the present and in the future to regenerate, uh, to uh, to reanimate this part of the town or the city or riverfront, etc. So I think the job there is to instill confidence, open up the minds of the people saying you can, be, you can, you can, because people are so uh, demoralized, uh, beaten by the Trumps and the others and the people who are governing us in this disastrous world today that maybe they think I can't for nothing. So the important thing is just to help people to regain this confidence that they can change their destiny, that they can at least trace some pointers. They can they can try some uh, to, to, to get involved in something. And once they try, that confidence will remain with them. Um, you know, learning something new even. In, the, in that sense, the kind of social engagement is, even in learning something new, um, it would be helpful for, for, for a community. Thanks, Leah. Thank you so much. And thanks for a wonderful presentation. It was thought provoking. It was um, in depth. And you've obviously thought about these issues for many, many years. Um, we are and many failures, not <laughs> just successes, because eh? you learn from failures as well. Eh? Yes, and and we're at a point in in the evolution where we can't afford to fail any longer in in our world, and uh, that's what that's what we're all engaged in. I know that. Yes. Um, so we have an opportunity for with another webinar uh, in April where we ha will have uh, Deer Hunter uh, teasing out more about the cartological mapping process that they engage with, which complements beautifully with, I mean, it really is a type of cultural mapping process and almost a, a methodology for delivering on cultural mapping. And I know you'll be really interested in that yes, yourself. Definitely. We're also gathering together, uh, all of us in Glasgow, uh, during the week beginning the 22nd of April. I know that you're going to, to join us, Leah, and I hope that there are folks here who will join us. It will be live streamed uh, on the, the day of the 23rd, and we will be uh, in live in person in Glasgow in the CCA, um, if you're able to join us there too. It'd be fantastic to be back in Glasgow.
it will be fantastic to have you it's back. It's a great group. I, I'm delighted to be, genuinely, I'm delighted to be involved. And thank you, really, genuinely. Thank you for, uh, for involving me in the discussion. I think it, it's a very important uh, project. And uh, yeah, whatever help or I can give, I'll be happy to contribute. Thank you, Leah. You'll regret offering that, I promise you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Leah. Okay. Hope to see you in Glasgow. <laughs> okay. And thank you, everybody. Thanks to Leah. Thanks for everybody who contributed. Thank you for the Viner Building uh, team for their technical support. And we'll see you next time. Oh, bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.